Okay, cool. So for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Alec. I work on the Android app for Square Cash. Um, but this talk is more focused around IntelliJ and IDEA. So if you work in IntelliJ, Android Studio, even like PyCharm or any of the other IDEA instances, this is, uh, this is pretty relevant if you're interested in like tooling. Um, so the talking for this plugin is called in IntelliJ plugins, where is the documentation? Uh, and the answer is there isn't any. Or, well, I have like an addendum there at the bottom. There is a lot of documentation for very specific things. Um, and what I mean by that is that like when you're starting out and you're looking at certain things, you'll find some stuff is heavily doc documented, other things aren't. Things like changes between API versions aren't like heavily documented, so that can get kind of confusing. Um, so the purpose of this talk isn't really to teach you how to write IntelliJ plugins. It's more to teach you how to like navigate uh, the IntelliJ APIs and like learn how to write one. Um, and so I, my experience with this is I write a IntelliJ plugin called SQL Delight. Um, which for Android gives you language tools around SQLite. Uh, in Android, you use SQLite usually as your backend, but typically what you do is you like write them in strings. So what SQL Delight does is it adds like syntax highlighting, autocomplete, um, those kind of things to SQLite. So writing that has been like a challenging experience where I sort of had to navigate these APIs on my own. And so I'm hoping I can like teach some of those things that I learned along the way uh, to you guys. And really what I'm going to be going over is like the underlying architecture for IntelliJ. And where that really starts is with a Java file, like an I.O. file. Um, and the first thing IntelliJ is going to do is get one of these files and then convert it to its own type um, called virtual file. And so really like all IntelliJ is doing, or for the most part what IntelliJ is doing, is it's like this really complicated file browser. And the files that IntelliJ are dealing with are these virtual files. And so it's going to be doing this automatically, converting I.O. files to virtual files. But if you wanted to do it manually, if you wanted to get a virtual file from an I.O. file, um, you can use this line of code, local file system, get instance, find file by I.O. file. Uh, you're really not going to have to do this very often. Usually, you're actually going to get the virtual file passed to you. But um, for most of like the actual things that I'll be going over, I'll, I'll show you how you can get it through code if you need to. Um, but yeah, so virtual files, they're IntelliJ's representation of a file. There's one for every file. And really the reason that they exist is to sort of give you more information, like contextual information, but a file that you wouldn't usually get from the I.O. file. Um, so like, for instance, a file when it gets deleted is no longer like on the system, but a virtual file will persist after it's been deleted. Um, and that's because you might like have references to it in your code. And so typically before you start acting on a virtual file, you'll call is valid to see if you can actually uh, uh, do things with it. And then there's these two other like sort of auxiliary classes, virtual file listener, virtual file manager. Um, and what they do is they, they give you more like helpers and specifically for the file listener, they give you these like lifecycle callbacks for a virtual file. So you can tell when a file has been like renamed or a file has been moved. Um, and sometimes these things are relevant if like in your plugin you care about the name of a file or you care when a file has been moved, like getting an actual callback events for that, um, it comes in handy. So yeah, so this is IntelliJ's like top level architecture of a file, is a virtual file. And then one level deeper from that is actually gonna be a document. You can get a document uh, in two ways. Well, I, I guess it's the same way, they just do two slightly different things. The first one, get cached document, uh, and then the second, get document. The, the second one, get document, will, if, if the document hasn't been cached yet, it will give you back the document and then cache it. Get cached document will return null if the document hasn't been cached yet. Uh, and if you haven't already guessed, the most important thing about documents is that they are cached. So uh, a document is like, if you think of a file as having those like file level changes, of like movement and renaming, um, a document is like the text level changes. So in IntelliJ, when you're interacting with an editor, when you're like copy and pasting or inserting text, it's actually affecting the document, not the virtual file. Um, so you, anything you can do in an editor, uh, you can also do on a document. So yeah, the big ones are like insert and delete string, but you can also like copy paste. Um, but again, you're gonna have to like keep in mind that this is being cached. So you can get instances from it from things that are currently active, like the editor, but if you're trying to get it from a virtual file, something that isn't active, then you have to make sure that you're uh, loading it into memory before like, dealing with it. And then similar to virtual file, there's a, there's a document listener here. Um, and so the, these are like the three layers of a file um, that the IntelliJ has, specifically the two on the right, right, the virtual file and the document. The one on the left, the I.O. file, uh, you shouldn't really be interacting with. And actually, it, it goes a step further than that because 
virtual file you're not making text level changes on, but document you should be making text level changes on, but you can actually, you can also make changes to the IO file, but it's really important to remember that you should never do that. You should only be making changes to the document, not to the IO file. And the reason for that is that when you make changes to the document, they aren't yet on disk. IntelliJ has like its own internal syncing mechanisms um, that when you make changes to the document every once in a while they will get synced back to the disk. But if the file has also changed on disk, then you'll get these like concurrency issues and they'll present themselves to the user saying like, hey, you changed this in IntelliJ, but also it changed on disk. Which one do you want to take? And so like if you're writing a tool, you, you don't want to be the one introducing those bugs. Typically it'll be uh, if you're if you're editing a file from like the command line, right, then you might see those those pop-ups come up in IntelliJ. But if you're writing a tool, you don't want to uh, produce those pop-ups inside the actual plugin. So you, re you really only want to be making changes to the, the virtual file in the document. So yeah, this is sort of the, the file level of, uh, of IntelliJ, but there's there's a more important level that you're actually going to be interacting with. Right. That, that's if you want to go backwards, you can go from document to virtual file. Um, but yeah, so th there's this more important level to IntelliJ, which is the actual syntax tree. So if you're familiar with uh, abstract syntax trees, like this is can be like very similar to what you've experienced before. Um, you just have like rule and terminal nodes. So something like a something like a Java class, right, is going to be a rule, whereas like a identifier or tokens, like a semicolon, right, is going to be a terminal node. Um, and so you're typically, if you want to be doing like these language level things, then you're going to be interacting with like the actual AST node. Um, all of the traversal through the AST, the syntax tree, is done at runtime. This find child by type. So say if you're in a class and you only care about doing something on the methods, then you're going to be calling this function find child by type, and you're going to be iterating over the methods there. But since it's done at runtime, like you can run into these like class casting exceptions. So you, you kind of have to be conscious of that. Um, so there's this AST node, and then there's one other layer, which is PSI. And PSI is is the most important part of IntelliJ. And there's, there's a bunch of different ways you can get to it. Um, if you're going from a virtual file, then you can use this PSI manager. If you're going from a document, you can use, uh, I believe it's PSI document manager dot get instance. And then uh, you'll notice as well, there's these like get cached versions. So it's similar where a PSI file is going to be cached just like a document. Um, and then the, the final way you can get to it is from an AST node. Um, and that's just going to be calling get PSI. Now what I mentioned before too, right, is that all of this abstract syntax tree and like navigation is, is runtime. It's the same for PSI, unfortunately. So you can see in that second line there, uh, the first one is just going to return a generic PSI element. The second one is you're telling it like, oh, this is a PSI field and I want that type back. Um, oh, another thing to mention here, I'll bring up now because it comes up a bit more later. I'm using Kotlin syntax for most of this. Um, if you're familiar with Java, then it'll be very readable to you. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. But uh, yeah, like in this case, you're just like, that's essentially PSI field dot class in Java. So you're just saying, give me a PSI back and then cast it as PSI field for me. So again, like this is going to throw runtime exceptions if the actual type for that AST node isn't a field, like if you called it on a method or something. So what is PSI? Well, uh, PSI stands for Program Structure Interface. Um, and it has a one-to-one -one mapping with AST nodes. AST nodes are sort of responsible for creating the, the program structure interface. And it's like, it's the contextual part of IntelliJ. So like the real strength of working in IntelliJ, if you were just working with like the AST, then you'd have to do all this navigation on your own. But PSI sort of has knowledge about the rest of the language and the rest of the language that, like the rest of the code that you're actually working with. So something like uh, resolving a field, right? If you have like an object and you do like object.field, in IntelliJ you can command click on the field and it'll bring you to the source, right? It'll bring you to where the field was actually declared. Um, and that's actually, that's a method on PSI elements, which is just called resolve. So like you call resolve on any PSI element and it will return to you the PSI element that is the source. And just that one function powers like a lot of different features in IntelliJ. Uh, things like autocomplete refactoring is a big one because all you have to do when you're refactoring is if you change the name of one element, you find every other PSI element that uh, references it, that resolves to it, and then you also change the name of that one. So it powers a bunch of features just knowing what that PSI element resolves to, knowing like the contextual things around it. Um, yeah, so it maps one-to-one -one with AST nodes. 
Uh, one other thing I want to mention here is PSI tree utils. So I, I've been mentioning that like you're doing all this traversal at runtime. Um, the PSI tree util is essentially this one giant helper class that makes it a lot easier. So it has methods like find child by type, which will return null if there's no child of that type. So like in the example I had before, if you have a class PSI element and you want just the methods, you can call like PSI class, the instance of that, um, find child by type PSI method. And it'll return a list of all the PSI methods that belong to that class. So it, it makes the traversal a lot easier rather than just like calling get children and iterating them over yourself. Um, now, like with AST nodes, right, they have those terminal nodes. PSI elements similarly will have these things called leaf elements, which behave exactly the same as PSI elements, really. Um, it's, it's just another part of the traversal. Uh, so I, I talked a bit about how the file level was being created um, down to the document. But the AST node and the PSI element are sort of part of their own little like creation mechanism that's called the parser definition. And unless you're writing a language plugin, so unless you're making a plugin that uh, is providing language level features like syntax highlighting, um, then you're not going to have to worry about this. But uh, the default ones, so like Java and XML, have them already written for you. And because they're open source, you can, you can interface with them and actually like include yourself in, in what's going on there. Um, and essentially what the parser definition is responsible for is like taking a parse string, taking a buffer, and turning it into these classes. That's really all it does. Um, and you have to supply these two classes to it. One's called the lexer, and one is called the parser. Um, and what happens there is the text goes into the lexer, and it gets turned into tokens. And the tokens get passed to the parser, and it outputs the AST tree. Um, so that's like, those are the, the first big step. Essentially, you get the text passed to you, turns into tokens. And then the parser turns it into the AST tree tree. And then the final thing that the parser definition is going to do is take an AST node and actually turn it into a PSI element. Which you might think is kind of weird because it's like, okay, well, I just had these tokens and turned it into the syntax tree. Like, why am I then turning it into a PSI element? If they're one-to-one -one and they're both like these tree traversal things, like what's the difference between them? The big difference really is that contextual thing I was talking about. So where the PSI element will like resolve fields for you and perform refactoring and autocomplete and things like that for you. The AST, those nodes are actually going to be doing like the language level things. So uh, a good example is actually a formatter. With a formatter, all you care about are like the actual uh, AST nodes. So something like methods, right? You might want to say like two methods need to have exactly one new line between them. Um, that doesn't need to know about all the contextual like PSI stuff. What it does need to know is it needs to know like this node has type method. And those kind of things are present on the AST node where a PSI element like the class type sort of says what it is and then it will resolve, autocomplete, all of those other things. Um, so yeah, this, this parser definition is, is what's responsible for taking in text and then shooting at the actual syntax tree. So yeah, th this is like this little diagram. It's just, it's the model that IntelliJ is using to create um, its own representations of the language as well as your files. And when you're writing a plugin, this is what you're going to be interacting with. Um, most often it's going to be like those PSI elements. You'll have like a PSI element given to you and then you'll have to like say that, uh, well, this resolves to this or like these are the possible solutions for what's currently typed there. Um, yeah, the, the PSI element is really what you're going to be working with most often. Um, other than that, it might be like virtual files again if like things are changing. But there's this, this other level that I wanted to talk about, um, which is like the actual application. So the application itself, you might care about um, like specific callbacks, for example, or like state about IntelliJ. Um, and there's, there's also different levels to the application. So th at the top, there is the application itself. You can think about this as like IntelliJ actually in the dock. Um, that's going to be one application. And like that maps to a single object. Um, and you can get that object by calling application manager .get application. And this object really does two main things. The first one is store all of that state, like I mentioned before. So like is read access allowed? Um, is write access allowed? Uh, are we in early access preview? Get the start time. Those are all things that you might care about. Um, for example, if you're in an exception, right, you might want to know, okay, are we in early access preview? Because like that exception might be specific to only this build. Or like, is this a really long running instance of IntelliJ? Um, this exception might only be happening in those cases. So like application state, you get it from this. But the other important thing that applications manage 
uh, is concurrency. And this is really big. This is important because IntelliJ's concurrency management has a lot of like hidden benefits to it that if you use properly, you get a lot of stuff for free. So the big one is like this run write action. Anything you perform in a single run write action, so you'll call like application dot run write action and then pass it a runnable. And anything that happens in that runnable is treated as a single write action. And what that means is that in the editor, if you do undo, then it'll undo everything that was in that write action. And like these transactions are all sort of nested, so you can nest these and like if you undo, it'll actually undo all of the write actions that were part of that one tree. Uh, so it's, it's important to make sure that all the edits you are making are in a run write action. But the other thing it does is it manages uh, the actual concurrency level. So if you try and like read from a file and it's currently being written to, then that thread is going to block. And you'll actually get a lot of runtime exceptions if you don't use these properly. Um, so it's, it's something to like be aware of. Usually, you, you know, the editor will actually tell you like, okay, you need to call this from a write action. Um, so you don't have to be too conscious of it, but like taking advantage of it, uh, it can give you a lot of superpowers. The next level down is the project. Uh, and you can think of the project as like one IntelliJ window. Um, you'll find that each, each one of these sort of maps to actual UI elements of IntelliJ. Um, so yeah, in this case, the project is, is a single window. And again, what it's mostly going to give you is like state about the project. Um, the other thing it does is it gives you these managers. That, if you've noticed, like most of the code examples I've been given have been stuff like project manager .get instance, but like PSI manager .get instance, PSI document manager .get instance. It's this pattern that JetBrains is like very, very, uh, very fond of, where you pass a project to a manager, and then you can do things on that project with context to only that project. So you can do things on, say, only the virtual virtual files that are a member of this project. So what you're most often going to be doing with a project is actually passing it to those managers to tell them which project you want to do work on. Um, other than that, you're not really going to be interacting with it a lot. The next level down is a module. Uh, and a module maps to, well, like IntelliJ modules. So again, you have like a single doc instance, multiple windows, which are each projects, and then inside each project, you're going to have multiple different modules. Um, the modules, again, we'll say about the module, but the big thing that they're going to be doing um, is performing searches. And this can be important if you're, say you're auto-completing code, but you only want to auto-complete stuff that's in the test folder. The module is the one that's going to know about that. It knows like the different variants that are part of that module. Um, so when you're performing searches, you can like specify the actual scope of the search with reference to the module. So only like unit tests that are part of this module. And again, you're going to get it by using the module manager get instance and then pass it to the project. So that, that's only going to return to you the modules that are a member of that project. And then the final layer down is these virtual files that we talked about last time. And uh, to get virtual files for something, you can do it one of two ways. Um, you can iterate the content for a single module or you can iterate the content for a single project. You're probably not going to have to do this too much. Usually like a virtual file will be passed to you and then you'll start like doing work on it. But in the case that you actually do want to iterate everything for like a single module, a single project, uh, this is how you do it. So yeah, these are, these are the different layers of an actual IntelliJ project application module. Um, but one thing that's important about these is that these are also going to be essentially your life cycle parts of the uh, working with IntelliJ. So like the application will have its own life cycle, the project will have its own life cycle, uh, and those, those are all important because they're, they can be the entry points into your actual code. Um, so for each one of those things that I mentioned on the last slide, there is a class called component with reference to that. So there's an application component, project component, and module component. And all these do is give you those lifecycle callbacks for that particular object. So if you cared about when the application was opened or closed and you wanted to do certain cleanups or startup stuff, then you can make an application component. Similar for like project and module, oftentimes you don't want code to run until the actual module has been opened. Um, and like each layer down, you're actually going to get even more callbacks. So like project will have a project opened and project closed. Because in IntelliJ, like you can right click on a project and actually close it entirely. Um, and again, you're not going to be wanting certain code to run when the project is closed. So yeah, these lifecycle callbacks, um, 
they're going to give you like an entry point into your actual plugin. And the way that you tell IntelliJ that these exist is through something called the configuration file. Um, and it's this XML file that you use to essentially describe the layout of, uh, of your plugin. If you're familiar with like Android and it's manifest, it's, it's a little similar. Um, and in it, you're going to declare all of your components. Uh, and it's this really verbose way of saying like, yeah, these are my application components, project components, module components. Um, essentially, all your configuration file is, is that like idea plugin at the top, and then you list a bunch of stuff afterwards. And it's used for things other than the uh, components. It's also going to be getting used um, to describe the plugin itself. So things like the name, um, what versions of IntelliJ it's applicable for, um, uh, you list the components there. And then another important thing that I want to talk a bit more about is these extensions. So uh, up to now, I've said that like the way of entering into your plugin is through these components, and that's how you can uh, like start running code. The other big one that you'll have to be using is these extension points. And what they are is uh, specifying specific services that are going to run in uh, certain situations. So some examples of these would be uh, at the bottom there, like we have go to declaration handler. So this service is going to run every single time you command click on an element. Um, it'll give you a PSI element and then you can specify if you want to override the location it's going to and tell it to go somewhere else. Um, post startup activity is going to give you a callback for when startup has completed um, and that's a little bit different like indexing for example will we'll postpone the callback in post startup activity so it's a way of saying like once everything has finished initializing then that will get a callback. Error handler is a way of registering your own um, exception reporting so if you've, if you've ever run into an exception while running IntelliJ you'll see that little red pop-up show up and then from there you can like report to JetBrains you can register your own and you can say, okay, well, report to Square and then it'll send an email or report to Bugsnag, like however you want to deal with that exception. The fourth one, down completion contributor, um, is actually what it sounds like. I mean, you, you describe what language you want it to run on. So if you're in like an XML file, then this one won't run because it's, it's only specifying Java. And that's going to run every single time you do control space bar, right? And you start auto completing something, then it's going to give a callback or it's going to go into your completion contributor and then you'll specify what other elements could complete uh, the current position. So yeah, you're, you're typically defining these like per language um, so that they're not executing at times that you don't want them to. You can, if you're writing a plugin and you want other plugins to be able to interface with it, you can create your own extension points. And that's what this, like the, at the top of the block, that default extensions namespace, that's what that's for. You can have a separate extensions block with a different namespace. Um, so say if you were interfacing with like the Rust plugin or something, then you might want to extend some of their um, APIs so that you can provide more uh, details to it. But uh, what I really want to go into here is an example of that completion contributor because it'll showcase a little bit of what I've been talking about with like these PSI elements and, and how, they, um, how they are given to you, how you can like interact with them, um, and just essentially how this architecture is being used. So completion contributor, um, you're going to implement it yourself, and all you're going to really do is call this one method um, during the constructor or initialization called extend. And this, what that's going to do is it's going to register an actual provider for completions. So you could ex extend a bunch of different times, specify when each completion provider is going to run, and then they will actually be in charge of providing uh, the different completion results, the different lookup elements. And this extend function, it, it takes a few different parameters. The first one is the completion type, and there's really only two. There's basic, and then there's classes. And the reason that there's a class completion type is that uh, for things like when you're typing periods, right? Like sometimes you can complete a class quicker by just doing like c dot s dot a, and then that'll find like com dot sample dot application. So uh, typically you're just going to be doing completion type basic, but if you're completing class names, um, then you might want to do completion type class. The second, uh, the second parameter you're passing to this is the pattern, and the pattern is going to specify which PSI elements you want the provider to run on. So in this case, um, if you remember, I'm specifying already that I only want to run for Java elements, so my pattern is going to be Java elements that are PSI identifiers. So my completion provider is only going to run for identifiers in Java. And then the third thing you pass to it is the actual completion provider. Uh, and the completion provider Again, all it's going to do is actually add the completions to the result set. 
And so when they control spacebar, everything that you do inside this block is going to affect um, essentially what shows up in that dropdown. So the, the example I have here is like extremely simple. All I'm doing is I'm saying, okay, well add the word Shrek to the current result dropdown and then stop here. That line just says don't run any other completion providers. Now all the, all the like default ones like Java are gonna run before mine. Um, so those autocompletes will still show up and then Shrek will be the only other one that shows up. Um, so one thing I wanna go over here though is, is what's actually going on behind the scenes because the way that IntelliJ does autocomplete and some other, um, some other features is, is like, it's not well documented and sometimes it will run into these situations where you don't know what's happening. Um, and this is actually a great example of this. So there, there's those three things that are being passed to you, parameters, context, and result. Um, parameters and result are really the ones that you care about. Result is like you're adding elements that are gonna show up in the dropdown. Parameters is what's given to you. So like the PSI element at the cursor position um, the PSI file that's given to you, but what you might not expect is that they're actually not the PSI, the original PSI file that the person is editing. So what IntelliJ actually does behind the scenes is the user has their cursor at a location and started typing, and then they hit Control Space Bar to begin autocomplete. IntelliJ copies the whole file, the whole file in memory, creates a new PSI file, throws it into the parser definition, which creates a new PSI tree and then it has inserted at the cursor position the string IntelliJ idea rules. It's inserted that at the cursor position so that when it gets parsed, that's actually part of the string that you're gonna be completing. And the reason for that is that, say you've just typed string, space, and then started autocompleting. So you haven't actually started typing anything yet. There's no way for the parser to know that that's going to be an identifier. So it inserts a string there so that it can parse and pretend that there's an identifier there, even though there isn't yet, so that when you get the PSI element, right, it'll pass the pattern saying that it's an identifier and you can start completing there. But if you were planning on using the text to like perform your autocomplete, then you would like run into weird bugs. You'd be like, okay, well, why is IntelliJ idea rules showing up here? Um, and so if you, if you attach a debugger inside this piece of code where I was adding a result, you'll see exactly what I was talking about. So there's, in the parameters, there's a few different things that are given to you. You can see a completion type basic, that's what we specified in the contributor. Um, but then there's these two things, original file, which is actually the file that we were copied from, and then position, which is the element at the cursor. Um, and you'll see it's an identifier, which is right, PSI identifier, because that's what we said we want to accept with our pattern. But you'll notice that the text is actually IntelliJ idea rules, which isn't at all the text that the person had written. So it's, it's a case of like something that you wouldn't expect happening, and like this happens all over the place in IntelliJ, you can run into bugs. And actually I ran into bugs while writing my own plugins because some code that I didn't want to run on this copy PSI file was running because I didn't realize that PSI files were sort of being created ad hoc. And because it's a lightweight process, IntelliJ does this all the time. So code that you might want running on only a single PSI file could be running on like tens of PSI files. Um, so it's something to be wary of. I find, I find attaching a debugger in, the, in actual code and like, looking at the stack, seeing like what IntelliJ is actually doing before it gets to you is a really good way of learning about their process. Um, and without doing that, I, I wouldn't have even known that this happened, like this isn't documented anywhere. But yeah, so we have this completion provider now um, that just adds Shrek. Something also worth noting, like you can add Shrek and it will only show up if they've typed SR, SHR um, or like letters afterwards. It won't show up if they've typed like the letter X. Um, so it already does all of that uh, the string checking for you, all the string matching. You don't have to worry about that. Um, but just this, everything that's on this one slide is a fully functional plugin because you've specified in your extension point, this is a completion contributor. And then you've included the class, which has a completion provider. Um, and if we actually run it, uh, like it's a working plugin, that's all you need. So I'll show you. I actually did compile this plugin. You can see every time an identifier is coming up, the word Shrek is also being included. So fields have Shrek. Um, even like method names can be called Shrek because they're also identifiers. Uh, parameters also Shrek. Uh, return types Shrek. You could even cast it as Shrek if you want to. So you see like Shrek is showing up all over the place now because I didn't do any filtering in my completion provider. I just said blanketly like every time they're typing an identifier, um, give them the option of typing Shrek. So that you could imagine from here, you could do more complicated logic um, in your completion. And I mean, that, that would be a functional 
plugin. There's there's not too much more to it. And it's so it's these extension points that are giving you the uh, sort of the entry points for IntelliJ. It's when it's going to enter your code. And by registering these services, it, it's sort of like in Java when you call a thread dot register uncaught exception handler. We're like now that service is going to run in that situation um, as long as your plugin is active. So yeah, that's uh, that's an example of a completion contributor, but. If you're looking for other things or want to learn about other stuff, they might have their own nuances that are hard to find. So uh, I've included a little slide here about how you can learn about it as well. I began this by saying like there isn't any documentation or, or it's really hard to find. This, this is really the documentation and sort of the methods of getting your own documentation. The, the first point there is actually the one I found really, really useful. If you notice all my code examples or most of them, uh, sort of follow this pattern where you say like thing you care about manager dot instance. So a really good way of like going going around is like you can type something like con uh, contribution manager and then try and auto complete it, and you'll see all of the different APIs that are already in IntelliJ. You can like go in there, look at all the code, uh, and learn a whole lot about how IntelliJ is actually um, how it's running. Open source is huge. Uh, all of these plugins, and especially the JetBrains ones. They're all open source and they're, and they're so verbose, they have so much to them that pretty much anything you're doing, there will be a similar example in a plugin that already exists. So the examples I have there, Kotlin, Go, Rust, those are all written by JetBrains, so you can expect that they're going to be doing things like the right way. Um, looking in their plugin XML file, that configuration file, is a really great way to start um, because they have sort of descriptive names of all of their services. So if you cared about something like the compiler, um, some sort of service around the compiler, then you could go into their plugin XML file, search for compiler, and see which services they have um, that change how the compiler functions. The, the other thing you can do is the official IntelliJ documentation provides really good tutorials for like some of the starting stuff. So actually, the completion contributor, they give a basic example. Same with like uh, resolving references, the formatter, which I talked about earlier, they have a great example on that. Um, so they do a pretty good job. The JetBrains community forums, I find, is, is one of the most helpful ones because the JetBrains staff is really active in responding to your questions. So if you don't find any documentation on the thing you're interested in, you can contact those people by just going to the community forums and asking there. And then the last one is, is really interesting, AOSB, that's Android open source project. Um, because IntelliJ is really these like set of APIs for writing plugins, IDEs themselves are using all of these plugins. So you can look at like the Android Studio source code or even the IntelliJ source code and learn a lot about how they're doing things by default. I mentioned earlier like the IntelliJ one, it, it comes with a Java parser and an XML parser as well as all of the PSI bells and whistles for those two languages. So you can look through and see how they format Java or autocomplete Java, um, any sort of those things, they're, they're all gonna be open source and you can just look through. So this is really how you're gonna find documentation. Now, there's one thing I, I do want to mention, which is a slight warning, that because all of these plugins have so much power, um, it's actually possible for there to be like malicious plugins. And, and I, I encountered this because Android Studio is, because it's a fork of IntelliJ, they've written their own code for some things, and specifically for the error handler, which I mentioned before, they rewrote the error handler in Android Studio such that it always ignores whatever error handler you register and always reports to Google. And this took like a really long time to debug because I found in vanilla IntelliJ, my error handler was getting registered, but in Android Studio, it wasn't. And it was this like discrepancy in behavior that I didn't understand. I thought it was something I was doing, but it was actually because they had forked it and rewritten all this stuff. It was code that they had made, that they had like rewritten that uh, ignored our error handler. So like, it is possible for other plugins to change IntelliJ behavior, as well as other IDEs. So it's something to like be wary of if you're experiencing like weird behavior in specific situations, like if a certain plug is in, plugin is installed, um, then that could be a reason. So yeah, I, I just wanted to end this with like a brief interaction that happened on Twitter that I think really highlights what this presentation is about. Um, so this guy, he, he tweeted at IntelliJ and Dimitri, the, uh, the tech lead uh, at JetBrains, about how about a Udacity course on plugin development? I would love to extend my plugin more. Uh, I've seen usages, SQL Delight, IntelliJ, and Docs, but I can't figure out what I need and don't, how to create minimal product and expand. Uh, 
And uh, Dimitri responded, expand is the tricky part. Everyone needs entirely different guidance depending on the kind of plugin they're working on. Um, and this is really the tricky thing in trying to present or speak about this topic, is that everyone is going to be trying to do completely different things in IntelliJ. Um, and so the, the important thing to try and learn before going into it is those like foundational pieces, like virtual files and PSI elements. Um, but beyond that, they're not really going to figure out, there's, there's not going to be like one right answer that you'll find on the internet or through documentation. You sort of have to explore around and like do some guesswork um, in an attempt to do the right thing. Uh, and like again, going to the JetBrains forums, asking these kind of people is a really great way to figure it out. But most of the time, you're, it's really a learning experience of like going through this whole thing and, and figuring it out for yourself. 